chapter 22. When the woods again began to pour forth the dark-hued masses of the enemy, the youth felt serene self-confidence. He smiled briefly when he saw men dodge and duck at the long screeching of shells that were thrown in giant handfuls over them. He stood erect and tranquil, watching the attack begin against a part of the line that made a blue curve along the side of an adjacent hill. His vision being unmolested by smoke from the rifles of his companions, he had opportunities to see parts of the hard fight. It was a relief to perceive at last from whence came some of these noises which had been roared into his ears. Off a short way he saw two regiments fighting a little separate battle with two other regiments. It was in a cleared space wearing a set-apart look. They were blazing as if upon a wager, giving and taking tremendous blows. The firings were incredibly fierce and rapid. These intent regiments apparently were oblivious of all larger purposes of war and were slugging each other as if at a matched game. In another direction he saw a magnificent brigade going with the evident intention of driving the enemy from a wood. They passed in out of sight and presently there was a most awe-inspiring racket in the wood. The noise was unspeakable having stirred this prodigious uproar and apparently finding it too prodigious the brigade after a little time came marching airily out again with its fine formation in no wise disturbed there were no traces of speed in its movements the brigade was jaunty and seemed to point a proud thumb at the yelling wood on a slope to the left there was a long row of guns gruff and maddened denouncing the enemy who down through the woods were forming for another attack in the pitiless monotony of conflicts. The round red discharges from the guns made a crimson flare and a high thick smoke. Occasional glimpses could be caught of groups of the toiling artillerymen. In the rear of this row of guns stood a house, calm and white, amid bursting shells. A congregation of horses tied to a long railing were tugging frenziedly at their bridles. Men were running hither and thither. The detached battle between the four regiments lasted for some time. There chanced to be no interference, and they settled their dispute by themselves. They struck savagely and powerfully at each other for a period of minutes, and then the lighter-hued regiments faltered and drew back, leaving the dark blue lines shouting. The youth could see the two flags shaking with laughter amid the smoke remnants. Presently there was a stillness pregnant with meaning. The blue lines shifted and changed a trifle, and stared expectantly at the silent woods and fields before them. The hush was solemn and church-like, save for a distant battery that, evidently unable to remain quiet, sent a faint rolling thunder over the ground. It irritated like the noises of unimpressed boys. The men imagined it would prevent their perched ears from hearing the first words of the new battle. Of a sudden, the guns on the slope roared out a message of warning. A sputtering sound had begun in the woods. It swelled with amazing speed to a profound clamor that involved the earth in noises. The splitting clashes swept along the lines until an interminable roar was developed. To those in the midst of it, it became a din fitted to the universe. It was the whirring and thumping of gigantic machinery, complications among the smaller stars. The youth's ears were filled up. They were incapable of hearing more. On an incline over which a road wound, he saw wild and desperate rushes of men, perpetually backward and forward, in riotous surges. These parts of the opposing armies were two long waves that pitched upon each other, madly at dictated points. To and fro they swelled, sometimes one side by its yells and cheers would proclaim decisive blows, but a moment later the other side would be all yells and cheers. Once the youth saw a spray of light forms go in hound-like leaps toward the waving blue lines. There was much howling, and presently it went away with a vast mouthful of prisoners. Again he saw a blue wave dash with such thunderous force against a gray obstruction that it seemed to clear the earth of it and leave nothing but trampled sod. And always, in their swift and deadly rushes to and fro, the men screamed and yelled like maniacs. Particular pieces of fence or secure positions behind collections of trees were wrangled over as gold thrones or pearl bedsteads. There were desperate lunges at these chosen spots seemingly every instant, and most of them were bandied like light toys between the contending forces. The youth could not tell from the battle flags flying like crimson foam 
in many directions which color of cloth was winning. His emaciated regiment burst forth with undiminished fierceness when its time came. When assaulted again by bullets, the men burst out in a barbaric cry of rage and pain. They bent their heads in aims of intent hatred behind the projected hammers of their guns. Their ramrods clanged loud with fury as their eager arms pounded the cartridges into the rifle barrels. The front of the regiment was a smoke wall penetrated by flashing points of yellow and red. Wallowing in the fight, they were in an astonishingly short time, resmudged. They surpassed in stain and dirt all their previous appearances. Moving to and fro with strained exertion, jabbering the while, they were with their swaying bodies, black faces and glowing eyes, like strange and ugly friends, jiggling heavily in the smoke. The lieutenant returning from a tour after a bandage, produced from a hidden receptacle of his mind new and potentious oaths suited to the emergency. Strings of expletives he swung lash-like over the backs of his men, and it was evident that his previous efforts had in no wise impaired his resources. The youth, still the bearer of the colors, did not feel his idleness. He was deeply absorbed as a spectator. The crash and swing of the great drama made him lean forward, intent-eyed, his face working in small contortions. Sometimes he prattled words, coming unconsciously from him in grotesque exclamations. He did not know that he breathed, that the flag hung silently over him, so absorbed was he. A formidable line of the enemy came within dangerous range. They could be seen plainly, tall, gaunt men, with excited faces running with long strides toward a wandering fence. At sight of this danger, the men suddenly ceased their cursing monotone. There was an instant of strange silence before they threw up their rifles and fired a plumping volley at the foes. There had been no order given. The men, upon recognizing the menace, had immediately let drive their flock of bullets without waiting for word of command. But the enemy were quick to gain the protection of the wandering line of fence. They slid down behind it with remarkable celerity, and from this position they began briskly to slice up the blue men. These latter braced their energies for a great struggle. Often white clenched teeth shone from the dusky faces. Many heads surged to and fro, floating upon a pale sea of smoke. Those behind the fence frequently shouted and yelped in taunts and gib-like cries, but the regiment maintained a stressed silence. Perhaps at this new assault, the men recalled the fact that they had been named mud diggers, and it made their situation thrice bitter. They were breathlessly intent upon keeping the ground and thrusting away the rejoicing body of the enemy. They fought swiftly and with a despairing savageness denoted in their expressions. The youth had resolved not to budge whatever should happen. Some arrows of scorn that had buried themselves in his heart had generated strange and unspeakable hatred. It was clear to him that his final and absolute revenge was to be achieved by his dead body lying torn and gluttering upon the field. This was to be a poignant retaliation upon the officer who had sent mule drivers and later mud diggers. For in all the wild graspings of his mind for a unit responsible for his sufferings and commotions, he always seized upon the man who had dubbed him wrongly. And it was his idea vaguely formulated that his corpse would be for those eyes a great and salt reproach. The regiment bled extravagantly. Grunting bundles of blue began to drop. The orderly sergeant of the youth company was shot through the cheeks. Its supports being injured, his jaw hung far down, disclosing in the wide cavern of his mouth a pulsing mass of blood and teeth. And with it all, he made attempts to cry out. In his endeavor, there was a dreadful earnestness as if he conceived that one great shriek would make him well. The youth saw him presently go rearward. His strength seemed in no wise impaired. He ran swiftly, casting wild glances for succor. Others fell down about the feet of their companions. Some of the wounded crawled out and away, but many lay still, their bodies twisted into impossible shapes. The youth looked once for his friend. He saw a vehement young man, powder smeared and frazzled, whom he knew to be him. The lieutenant also was unscathed in his position at the rear. He had continued to curse, but it was now with the air of a man who was using his last box of oaths. 
for the fire of the regiment had begun to wane and drip. The robust voice that had come strangely from the thin ranks was growing rapidly weak. End of chapter 22. Chapter 23. The colonel came running along the back of the line. There were other officers following him. We must charge him, they shouted. We must charge him. They cried with resentful voices, as if anticipating rebellion against this plan by the men. The youth, upon hearing the shouts, began to study the distance between him and the enemy. He made vague calculations. He saw that to be firm soldiers, they must go forward. It would be death to stay in the present place, and with all the circumstances to go backward, would exalt too many others. Their hope was to push the galling forces away from the fence. He expected that his companions, weary and stiffened, would have to be driven to this assault, but as he turned toward them, he perceived with a certain surprise that they were giving quick and unqualified expressions of assent. There was an ominous, clanging overture to the charge when the shafts of the bayonets rattled upon the rifle barrels. At the yelled words of command, the soldiers sprang forward in eager leaps. There was new and unexpected forces in the movement of the regiment. A knowledge of its faded and jaded condition made the charge appear to be a paroxysm, a display of the strength that comes before a final feebleness. The men scampered in insane fever of haste, racing as if to achieve a sudden success before an exhilarating fluid should leave them. It was a blind and despairing rush by the collection of men in dusty and tattered blue, over a green sward and under a sapphire sky towards a fence dimply outlined in smoke, from behind which sputtered the fierce rifles of enemies. The youth kept the bright colors to the front. He was waving his free arm in furious circles, the while shrieking mad calls and appeals, urging on those that did not need to be urged, for it seemed that the mob of blue men hurling themselves on the dangerous group of rifles were again grown suddenly wild with an enthusiasm of unselfishness. From the many firings starting towards them, it looked as if they would merely succeed in making a great sprinkling of corpses on the grass between their former position and the fence. But they were in a state of frenzy, perhaps because of forgotten vanities, and it made an exhibition of sublime recklessness. There was no obvious questioning, nor figurings, nor diagrams. There was apparently no considered loopholes. It appeared that the swift wings of their desires would have shattered against the iron gates of the impossible. He himself felt the daring spirit of a savage, religion mad. He was capable of profound sacrifices, a tremendous death. He had no time for dissections, but he knew that he thought of the bullets only as things that could prevent him from reaching the place of his endeavor. There were subtle flashings of joy within him that thus should be his mind. He strained all his strengths. His eyesight was shaken and dazed by the tension of thought and muscle. He did not see anything excepting the mist of smoke gashed by the little knives of fire. But he knew that in it lay the aged fence of a vanished farmer protecting the snuggled bodies of the gray men. As he ran, a thought of the shock of contact gleamed in his mind. He expected a great concussion when the two bodies of troops crashed together. This became a part of his wild battle madness. He could feel the onward swing of the regiment about him, and he conceived of a thunderous, crushing blow that would prostrate the resistance and spread consternation and amazement for miles. The flying regiment was going to have a catapult in effect. This dream made him run faster among his comrades who were giving vent to hoarse and frantic cheers. But presently he could see that many of the men in gray did not intend to abide the blow. The smoke rolling disclosed men who ran, their faces still turned. These grew to a crowd who retired stubbornly. Individuals wheeled frequently to send a bullet at the blue wave. But at one part of the line, there was a grim and obdurate group that made no movement. They were settled firmly down behind posts and rails. A flag ruffled and fierce waved over them and their rifles dinned fiercely. The blue whirl of men got very near until it seemed that in truth there would be a close and frightful scuffle. There was an expressed disdain in the opposition of the little group that changed the meaning of the cheers of the men in blue. They became yells of wrath directed personal. The cries of the two parties were now in sound and interchange of scathing insults. 
They in blue showed their teeth, their eyes shone all white. They launched themselves at the throats of those who stood resisting. The space between dwindled to an insignificant distance. The youth had centered the gaze of his soul upon the other flag. Its possession would be high pride. It would express bloody minglings near blows. He had a gigantic hatred for those who made great difficulties and complications. They caused it to be as a craved treasure of mythology, hung amid tasks and contrivances of danger. He plunged like a mad horse at it. He was resolved it should not escape if wild blows and darings of blows could seize it. His own emblem, quivering and a flare, was wringling toward the other. It seemed there would shortly be an encounter of strange beaks and claws as of eagles. The swirling body of blue men came to a sudden halt at close and disastrous range and roared a swift volley. The group in gray was split and broken by this fire, but its riddled body still fought. The men in blue yelled again and rushed in upon it. The youth in his leaping saw as through a mist a picture of four or five men stretched upon the ground or writhing upon their knees with bowed heads as if they had been stricken by bolts from the sky. Tottering among them was the rival color bearer whom the youth saw had been bitten virtually by the bullets of the last formidable volley. He perceived this man fighting a last struggle, the struggle of one whose legs are grasped by demons. It was a ghastly battle. Over his face was the bleach of death, but set upon it was the dark and hard lines of desperate purpose. With this terrible grin of resolution, he hugged his precious flag to him and was stumbling and staggering in his design to go the way that led to safety for it. But his wounds always made it seem that his feet were retarded, held, and he fought a grim fight, as with invisible ghouls fastened greedily upon his limbs. Those in advance of the scrambling blue men, howling cheers, leaped at the fence. The despair of the lost was in his eyes as he glanced back at them. The youth's friend went over the obstruction in a tumbling heap and sprang at the flag as a panther at prey. He pulled at it and wrenching it free swung up its red brilliancy with a mad cry of exultation even as the color bearer gasping lurched over in a final throw and stiffening convulsively turned his dead face to the ground. There was much blood upon the grass blades. At the place of success there began more wild clamorings of cheers. The men gesticulated and bellowed in an ecstasy. When they spoke, it was as if they considered their listener to be a mile away. What hats and caps were left to them, they often slung high in the air. At one part of the line, four men had been swooped upon, and they now sat as prisoners. Some blue men were about them in an eager and curious circle. The soldiers had trapped strange birds, and there was an examination. A flurry of fast questions was in the air. One of the prisoners was nursing a superficial wound in the foot. He cuddled it, baby-wise, but he looked up from it often to curse with an astonishing, utter abandon straight at the noses of his captors. He consigned them to red regions. He called upon the pestential wrath of strange gods, and with it all, he was singularly free from recognition of the finer points of the conduct of prisoners of war. It was as if a clumsy clod had trod upon his toe and he conceived it to be his privilege, his duty, to use deep, resentful oaths. Another, who was a boy in years, took his plight with great calmness and apparent good nature. He conversed with the men in blue, studying their faces with his bright and keen eyes. They spoke of battles and conditions. There was an acute interest in all their faces during this exchange of viewpoints. It seemed a great satisfaction to hear voices from where all had been darkness and speculation. The third captive sat with a morose countenance. He preserved a stoical and cold attitude. To all advances, he made one reply without variation. Ah, go to hell. The last of the four was always silent and for the most part kept his face turned in unmolested directions. From the views the youth received, he seemed to be in a state of absolute dejection. Shame was upon him and with it profound regret that he was perhaps no more to be counted in the ranks of his fellows. The youth could detect no expression that would allow him to believe that the other was giving a thought to his narrowed future. The pictured dungeons, perhaps, and starvations and brutalities liable to the imagination, all to be seen with shame for captivity and regret for the right to antagonize. 
After the men had celebrated sufficiently, they settled down behind the old rail fence, on the opposite side to the one from which their foes had been driven. A few shot perfunctorily at distant marks. There was some long grass. The youth nestled in it, rested, making a convenient rail support the flag. His friend, jubilant and glorified, holding his treasure with vanity, came to him there. They sat side by side and congratulated each other. End of chapter 23. In chapter 24. The roarings that had stretched in a long line of sound across the face of the forest began to grow intermittent and weaker. The stentorian speeches of the artillery continued in some distant encounter, but the crashes of the musketry had almost ceased. The youth and his friend of a sudden looked up, feeling a deadened form of distress at the waning of these noises which had become a part of life. They could see changes going on among the troops. There were marchings this way and that way, a battery wheeled leisurely on the crest of a small hill was the thick gleam of many departing muskets. The youth arose. Well, what now, I wonder, he said. By his tone, he seemed to be preparing to resent some new monstrosity in the way of dins and smashes. He shaded his eyes with his grimy hand and gazed over the field. His friend also arose and stared. I bet we're going to get along out of this and back over the river, he said. Well, I swam, said the youth. They waited, watching. Within a little while, the regiment received orders to retrace its way. The men got up, grunting from the grass, regretting the soft repose. They jerked their stiffened legs and stretched their arms over their heads. One man swore as he rubbed his eyes. They all groaned, Oh, Lord. They had as many objections to this change as they would have had to a proposal for a new battle. They tramped slowly back over the field across which they had run in a mad scamper. The regiment marched until it had joined its fellows. The reform brigade in column aimed through a wood at the road. Directly, they were in a mass of dust-covered troops and were trudging along in the way parallel to the enemy's lines as those had been defined by the previous turmoil. They passed within view of a stolid white house and saw in front of it Groups of the comrades lying in wait behind a neat breastwork. A row of guns were booming at a distant enemy. Shells thrown in reply were rising clouds of dust and splinters. Horsemen dashed along a line of entrenchments. At this point of its march, the division curved away from the field and went winding off in the direction of the river. When the significance of this movement had impressed itself upon the youth, he turned his head and looked over his shoulder toward the trampled and debris strewed ground. He breathed a breath of new satisfaction. He finally nudged his friend. Well, it's all over, he said to him. His friend gazed backward. By God, it is, he assented. They mused. For a time, the youth was obliged to reflect in a puzzled and uncertain way. His mind was undergoing a subtle change. It took moments for it to cast off its battlefield ways and resume its accustomed course of thought. Gradually, his brain emerged from the clogged clouds, and at last he was enabled to more closely comprehend himself and circumstance. He understood then that this experience of shot and countershot was in the past. He had dwelt in a land of strange, squalling upheavals, and had come forth. He had been where there was red of blood and black of passion and he was escaped. His first thoughts were given to rejoicing at this fact. Later he began to study his deeds, his failures, and his achievements. Thus, fresh from scenes where many of his usual machines of reflection had been idle, from where he had proceeded sheep-like, he struggled to marshal all his acts. At last, they marched before him clearly. From this present viewpoint, he was enabled to look upon them in spectacular fashion and to criticize them with some correctness, for his new condition had already defeated certain sympathies. Regarding his procession of memory, he felt gleeful and unregretting, for in it his public deeds were paraded in great and shining prominence. Those performances which had been witnessed by his fellows marched now in wide purple and gold, 
having various deflections. They went gaily with music. It was pleasure to watch these things. He spent delightful minutes viewing the gilded images of memory. He saw that he was good. He recalled with a thrilled joy the respectful comments of his fellows upon his conduct. Nevertheless, the ghost of his flight from the first engagement appeared to him and danced. There were small shoutings in his brain about these matters. For a moment he blushed, and the light of his soul flickered with shame. A specter of reproach came to him. There loomed the dogging memory of the tattered soldier. He who, gored by bullets and faint for blood, had fretted concerning an imagined wound in another. He who had loaned his last of strength and intellect for the tall soldier, he who, blind with weariness and pain, had been deserted in the field. For an instant a wretched chill of sweat was upon him at the thought that he might be detected in the thing. As he stood persistently before his vision, he gave vent to a cry of sharp irritation and agony. His friend turned. What's the matter, Henry? he demanded. The youth's reply was an outburst of crimson oath. As he marched along the little branch hung roadway, among these prattling companions, this vision of cruelty brooded over him. It clung near him always and darkened his view of these deeds in purple and gold. Whichever way his thoughts turned, they were followed by the somber phantom of the desertion in the fields. He looked stealthily at his companions, feeling sure that they must discern in his face evidences of this pursuit. But they were plodding in ragged array, discussing with quick tongues the accomplishments of the late battle. Oh, if a man should come up and ask me, I'd say we got a dumb good licking. Look in your eye. We ain't licked, sonny. We're going down here a ways swinging around and come in behind him. Oh, hush with your coming in behind him. I seen all of that I want to. Don't tell me about coming in behind. Bill Smithers, it says he'd rather have been in 1,100 battles than been in that hell of a hospital. He says they got shooting in the nighttime and shells dropped plumb among them in the hospital. He says such horn he never see. That's right. He's the best officer in this here regiment. He's a whale. Didn't I tell you we'd come around in behind him? Didn't I tell you so? We... Ah, uh, shut your mouth. For a time, this pursuing recollection of the tattered man took all elation from the youth's veins. He saw his vivid air, and he was afraid that it would stand before him all his life. He took no share in the chatter of his comrades, nor did he look at them or know them, save when he felt sudden suspicion that they were seeing his thoughts and scrutinizing each detail of the scene with the tattered soldier. Yet gradually he mustered force to put the sin at a distance, and at last his eyes seemed to open to some new ways. He found that he could look back upon the brass and bombast of his earlier gospels and see them truly. He was gleeful when he discovered that he now despised them. With this conviction came a store of assurance. He felt a quiet manhood, non-assertive, but of sturdy and strong blood. He knew that he would no more quail before his guides, wherever they should point. He had been to touch the great death, and found that after all, it was but the great death. He was a man. So it came to pass that as he trudged from the place of blood and wrath, his soul changed. He came from hot plowshares to prospects of clover tranquility. And it was as if hot plowshares were not. Scars faded as flowers. It rained. The procession of weary soldiers became a bedraggled train, despondent and muttering, marching with churning effort in a trough of liquid brown and mud under a low, wretched sky. Yet the youth smiled, for he saw that the world was a world for him. Though many discovered it to be made of oaths and walking sticks, he had rid himself of the red sickness of battle. The sultry nightmare was in the past. He had been an animal, blistered and sweating in the heat and pain of war. He turned now with a lover's thirst to images of tranquil skies, fresh meadows, cool brooks, an existence of soft and eternal peace. 
Over the river of golden ray of sun came through the host of leaden rain clouds. The end. End of the Red Badge of Courage, an episode of the American Civil War by Stephen Crane. Recording by Mike Vendetti, Canyon City, Colorado. MikeVendetti.com